Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace, and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and I'm honored to have back on the show our feature presenter for our Tuesday night weekly podcast event, certified clinical trauma professional, certified sex offender treatment provider, licensed professional counselor, founder of Survivor Support, podcast host of his own podcast and channels at John K. Euler LPC and at Unmasking the Trans Movement on YouTube, father of three, husband to his high school sweetheart, survivor advocate, professional knapsack remover, whistleblower, and someone I'm grateful to have on the battlefield with us, John Euler. In case you're new here or missed John's briefing on his background on the first episode we did together, here's a short recap of John's many accolades and credentials. John's work began over 30 years ago, and his education includes attending Epic Bible College, Biola University, Talbot School of Theology, and California State University in Fullerton. He's worked in both clinical and administrative capacities, outpatient and hospital settings, intensive day treatment settings, residential treatment programs, and insecure facilities, including over 11 years on psychology staff within the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, where he's logged more clinical contact hours within solitary confinement than any psych staff in the entire United States. Prior to his work with incarcerated men, he spent years working with sexual abuse survivors and treating severely emotionally disturbed adolescents in group homes and within the largest intensive psychiatric residential treatment facility for youth west of the Mississippi. When John is not providing professional therapy or podcasting, he serves in an advocacy role towards helping increase safety for vulnerable women and minors who are being placed in harm's way by those pushing dangerous ideologies, public policies, and legislation. It's been such a treat to have John on the show with us each week, and the value he's provided so far is priceless. If you've been tuning in the last few weeks, you've seen that we've deviated a little bit from the conversation around a survivor systems and parts and have been doing a deep dive into the mind of sexual deviants and perpetrators in order to better understand the type of person who would traumatize and abuse a child to begin with. John's incredible insight into healing survivors through his 30 plus years of working with sexual abuse and trauma victims mixed with his unparalleled work working in solitary confinement with some of the world's most sexual deviants makes John a force for nature and being able to explain both sides of the story from both the survivor and the perpetrator's point of view. John's presentations help those of us listening be able to understand two sides of, of an abuse spectrum that can be so difficult to comprehend if you're not an abuse survivor, and it's extremely valuable information in helping survivors claim their power back. If you've missed John's past episodes on the imagination, I'll have them in the show notes below. In previous episodes we've done, you can learn about a survivor systems and parts, dissociation and DID, boulders and knapsacks, psychopathy and narcissism, as well as the breakdown of what to look for in a therapist and what therapy should look like from both the survivors and therapist perspectives. So grab a pen and paper and expect another episode jam-packed with new information from our favorite resident therapist in the survivor community. Before I finish introducing today's guest, I wanted to give just a couple reminders and updates. If you'd like to be on the podcast as a guest or share any information privately with me, you can email me at imagineabetterworld2020 at gmail.com. 
You can also use this email if you'd like to be a part of my new book series featuring written survivor testimonies. And you can find the video with all the details on how to submit your testimony on any of my podcast channels. And lastly, I'd love your support on Substack, where I'm taking up investigative journalism as an outlet for me personally to share about my podcast guests and advocacy work. And you can subscribe to me there at www.emmacatherine.substack.com. All my links are in the show notes, and I'd love your support across all platforms. Thank you all for caring so deeply about survivors and whistleblowers and for helping to make the imagination the safest space on the internet for survivor and whistleblower disclosures. So you guys, without further ado, please help me in welcoming today's guest of honor, selfless man of God, voice for the voiceless, child abuse and survivor advocate, podcaster, Satan slayer, pedophile exposer, protector of the vulnerable, and therapeutic warrior, the one, the only, John Euler. John, thank you so much for being here again with me today this and this week. Good to be back with you. It's Not awesome to have you back. Good. This series has been just dynamite and the feedback we've been getting has been so great. You know, it's really fascinating, like I said in the intro, to see the the parallels and also the complete end of the spectrum of both ends of where you have worked in your career from working with the most deviant sexual predators there are to working with the most horrifically scarred and traumatized survivors who have gone through the unthinkable from the people you know, almost the same type of person that you were working with in solitary confinement. So I just want to thank you for all your work, being able to sort of tie all this together for us, because it's really been such a powerful series so far. Well, it's a privilege to kind of develop this with you. So. I agree. And so I thought today, like how we've been, we'd start with a question from the audience, if that's okay. Um, as I was scouring the questions that people have asked, I came across a really interesting one that I thought I would pick your brain about. I hadn't heard anybody ask about this. Um, and I think eventually as people start investigating more and learning, there'll be more questions like this. So I'm going to read you kind of an interesting question I came across and then I'll hand it over to you. So the question is, my question for John would be, do parts of you do your dreams for you? Isn't that a good one? Well, um, I I would say probably yes, in, in this sense. Right? We could. There's probably a lot of technical things we could go into, but for purposes of practicality, I would say that whether somebody has parts or not, you know, certainly things are worked out in dreams. So we're in the different dream states. Just as I had interviewed a guy that, uh, a combat war veteran, who only remembers a day and a half of three days of the invasion of Panama, so when the U.S. went into Panama to remove Noriega, he had to be medevaced out. He uh, had a bayonet impaled in his in his thigh as they were clearing out a building. So he's been working through that trauma, trauma of combat for about 40 years, has had reoccurring dreams, recurring nightmares, because there was a little, things he did that were moral dilemmas for him that he still has a hard time working through, realizing that a part of him did certain things. It's not like the, you know, the wanton massacre kind of thing, but still he was raised to value life and he finds himself in a very difficult situation as a 20-year-old. Well, as he and I have been working together, what should come up one day, one morning for him, as he's awakened out of a dream, something very unusual as far as it doesn't fit the normal thing that he's working through, combat-related. He literally has the same dreams of combat. He's had those for 40 years. Well, one day he has this dream of what it would amount to be a murder-suicide that took place in Salt Lake City. Well, it turns out it was real, but he awakens to this dream of walking down the street, and all of a sudden, about 25 feet ahead of him, is this big thud, 
and it was a body and he's looking at it and he starts to back up and there's another thud and now he's really backing up and there's another thud well after about seven thuds right so he's remembering or he's dreaming about this well it, it's very disconcerting so he awakens and he's describing it to his wife and as he is describing this dream comes to turn out it's not a dream but it's a memory that he had forgotten when he was in seventh grade when he was in junior high and he saw a a mother throwing her kids off i think the seventh story of a prominent hotel in salt lake city she had been married to a guy who was in essence a cult leader a small cult his own family he thought he was the messiah so he had killed himself the day before and given his wife instructions to take all the kids up and toss them off one survived because she was impaled on the railing and she's obviously not in good shape in all sorts of ways but the mother the mother eventually jumped so it's very interesting to think that here's a guy who was or is in therapy for working working through issues related to combat PTSD. That's hard enough. He has repressed memories because of that. But all of a sudden, 40 years later, he's dreaming, but it turns out that it wasn't a dream. It was a complete memory of an actual event. I have that on my site, that um, video. That is, in a way, how I would answer the question or respond to it in the sense that, oh, am I, okay, um, there you go. Thank you. If you go up to regular videos, yeah, that's right. So on my channel, scroll down, just, there we go. So you remembered. Okay, so that's Bert. Part one and part two. So repressed memories. Are they false and fictitious or a real thing? Uh, so I, I really recommend it because I had pondered that. I had thought about that. But here we have a, a guy who's no nonsense you know, about life and combat vet. And he had an actual repressed memory come up. Looked it up and it was to the T. He remembered all the details. So that's very compelling. That would be a good example then of how we can have complete memories that come up when we're dreaming. I don't necessarily think that Bert has um, child-related parts. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure of it. He himself, he actually discloses that he and I have worked together clinically. I was never going to say that. So to his credit, he's just a trooper and a half, pardon the pun there. Um, so you can see the, the effect of trauma as an adult. So he only remembers a day and a half of combat, but he had pushed that memory down. So if that dynamic can play out in the life of someone who doesn't have childhood trauma in terms of abuse, so he doesn't have DID, he doesn't have parts, how much more then, if somebody has parts, then when we are sleeping, those parts are very likely going to be releasing shall we say, information, they may likely uh, reveal uh, memories. That, I think, would be my short way of answering it. So should we take every single dream and uh, view it as something concrete, as a memory? No. I just think you need to take note of it. There are certain things that if you have, let's say, a reoccurring dream, if you've had the same exact dream, I have some clients with parts that have this. If you've had the same dream for a long period of time or it cycles, but here comes the same dream, I actually think it probably is a memory and it needs to be completed. I'm always very careful when it comes to quote unquote dream analysis because what a survivor needs more than anything are facts. So what I would say to a survivor is, 
if you have something that comes up, maybe view it as a dream first, and therefore view it as symbolic, but also tap into how you're feeling about it. So if you are being chased in dreams, the question is, what does it feel like as far as what's causing you to run? Is it that you fear something or do you think a part of you has actually been chased? Um, if you're having to hide, so kind of similar things. Um, if you're seeing people harmed, again, it could be that you saw it, but especially for survivors, I place a little more stock in dreams than it may very well be that a part is releasing that. So the best thing to do, so here would be my recommendation, journal. So when you wake up, try not to wait too long. Try to capture that. And then if you're in therapy, share it with your therapist. If you are writing it down in your journal, what very well might happen is if you go back later on and look at your handwriting, you may see that it's a little different style. And then you know that probably a part either allowed you to have a dream or is releasing a memory. And if it's a memory, eventually it'll come up and it will connect. That was pretty short. That was a record. <laughs> that was a great. That was a really great answer. And I appreciate how kind of gently you uh, approach the dream aspect of it. Because there's a lot of people that have been on my show that's sort of like this veteran received memories and dreams. And it was very confusing at first. And I love your strategy of sort of, uh, you know, journaling about it, seeing if it recurs, assessing how it makes you feel. I think those are all really good tips um, if somebody is wondering. And also to listen to your intuition. You know, there's, I think dreams and, and actual things that happen can feel very different, like what, you know, what John said. Um, and that that's how a lot of survivors that have come on my show expressed how they knew it was a a memory, not a dream. They're like, it just felt like, think about if, you know, say you're at the grocery store and you smell a cookie that is being given out at Costco, for example. And all of a sudden, like it brings up this memory of you having cookies at your grandma's house. Like there's moments that we remember good memories through nostalgia or things. And we're like, oh, I totally forgot about that. That like, I was at my grandma's house when I was three and she made a cookie and like, I'm remembering that, you know? Um, but like you can feel when stuff is real and it just kind of, it has this different feeling than whenever you wake up from a dream and it's like, oh man, I felt kind of deja vu -y, or it felt mm -hmm. uh, like it made my heart beat. It kind of got my, upset my nervous system a little bit, but I totally felt that it was fake. You know, there was like all this really weird stuff in it. So I love all your strategy on that, John. I really appreciate you answering that question. Well, you're quite welcome. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to work on the art of brevity which is a challenge for me. <laughs> so, but, well, we all, we yeah. all personally really love your deep dive. So thank you for, you know, being so uh, thorough with your explanations. Well, shall we get into it? Let's do it. We're going to be talking more about uh, sexual deviants and perpetrators. That's right. What a topic, huh? What a yeah. topic. Very necessary <laughs> topic. Yeah. And again, for those either just tuning in to what... Uh, they wouldn't know this is a series for so for those just tuning in or those that have been with us we we kind of did it as you said right we hung a sharp right so we were and we will we'll go back to we were developing a chart uh, or going through a chart that i developed uh, looking at what is an internal system like and so we're going to come back to that because we were getting ready to get into the primary stuff uh, the term Programming. I recently had somebody say, "Well, John, I know you don't like the term programming, so let me let me qualify that." Um, I I don't. Uh, on the one hand, I don't have an issue with it, and sometimes I'll probably even use the term. Uh, the reason I qualify it is I want people to understand that um, in order to be set free, you have to ultimately have control and have personal power. And if you believe that somebody outside of you has control, what do you do about that? Well, for me, a guiding principle is a guiding verse. It says, he who the sun sets free. So whoever got a set free, 
by coming into their life. God gives us his spirit. It's another way of saying we are spirit possessed. I'm possessed. Kind of an interesting thought. I'm possessed by God's spirit. God takes complete control. Now, the process of what's called sanctification, working out the reality of what's inside us, that's a lifetime process. Kind of like what John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. Jesus in the garden, he said, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. So it's a lifetime of growth. It's a lifetime. There's stages of spiritual growth, character growth, character development. But if someone has experienced really horrific stuff, what they've come to believe because they were told in one way or another that ultimately they are somebody else's possession. Somebody has the buttons, somebody has the knobs, somebody has the levers. That's not what the Bible teaches. It says that if God has come into my life, so if the Holy Spirit has possessed me, for those of us that have never thought of it in those terms, that's the reality. So I myself am possessed by God's Spirit. So he lives inside of me. He's not going to rent space with the demon, number one. The verse, and some people may have heard this verse, that if the house is swept clean, so there are a bunch of demons inside someone, they're kicked out. Jesus was going throughout the land of Israel, healing people and healing all diseases and casting out spirits. It's interesting to think that somebody can actually have demons cast out of them, but not become a Christian, not become spirit-filled, not have the Holy Spirit come inside of them. That's a choice. Well, if you had a bunch of demons inside you, and now through the power of God, get those demons cast out of you, and that's different than altars or parts that feel like they're demons. Big difference. Okay. But let's say actual demons that come out of someone Unless the person takes seriously the need to let the Holy Spirit come in, now you've got sort of a, a vacancy sign out there. Used to be occupied. Now there's an empty room. Well, if you don't take it seriously, guess what? More than likely, the demon that was in there wants to come back in. It liked its old uh, habitat. And it may bring others too. So I recommend everybody take seriously the need to become spirit-filled. And if that's the case, God is not going to rent space with a demon. So that issue is taken care of. So no Christian is demon-possessed. Your eternity is settled, by the way, so you don't have to wonder. And now the question is, how free are you? Well, we still have things to work through. We still have healing. But ultimately, are there strings attached, so to speak? Biblically, it doesn't allow for that. That's different than being oppressed. That happens all the time, right? Now, Jesus was oppressed by Satan himself. Paul a thorn was given to him. Now, was that a demon or, you know, meaning he had to battle that? So that's spiritual warfare. But there's a big difference between battling demons on the outside of you versus on the inside. Jesus said when he rose and he appeared to the disciples, when they, all the women believed, but the guys were a little slow, were a little dense, hard headed, right? So they appear. And they were freaked out, and they thought he was a spirit, a ghost. And so what does he do to prove to them? He asked for something to eat, you know, and they're, they're, right? It's not that he was translucent, and they're going to watch the piece of food go down his trachea, or, you know, down his throat. Um, and so what he told them is, listen, 
uh, spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. And that's really important as, as well to know, because there are a lot of survivors of SRA that believe that um, a demon could impregnate, impregnate them, could come inside them, pass from a perpetrator who was demon-possessed into them. And that's not true. Okay, that's a horrific experience, and it's very persuasive to a kid. So the idea of programming, in the literal sense, would mean that you have no control over it. Now, I've become ever increasingly aware, because I've been doing more studying, right? Are there technologies and things? Yeah, I'm not minimizing any of it. Think about even what we all live with, chemtrails. You know, we're, we're all being assaulted by technology and things like that. But as far as my spiritual condition, I have to know that God has set me free. So what we're dealing with, or what a survivor is dealing with, are the residual effects, the understandable residual effects of really having gone through horrific stuff. They played with your mind. They played with your emotions. They played with your belief system. And through the truth, that can be corrected, that can be rectified. And little by little, you can walk in freedom and in confidence. That's what I want people to know. So whoever God has set free is free indeed. That's why it added, that's an exclamation mark, could have been is free. But he added that extra part at the end of that sentence. That's like saying is free, but really free without a shadow of a doubt. Okay, so what we wrestle with, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of the air. That's a military structure. Satan is referred to as an evil genius. He's stronger than all of us, but he doesn't have godlike qualities. He's a created being. So we are not, as Paul said, we're not unaware. We're not ignorant of his strategies, his schemes, his wiles. So we need to be aware. He's pretty consistent. But for those that have been through SRA and MK Ultra, they experienced a very unique, like Super Bowl or Pro Bowl level of horrific stuff. To be able to be free from that really takes a lot of analysis on the survivor's part, because parts of them are persuaded. So when the term programming, that was a long way of saying. <laughs> so uh, if someone believes in programming, feels that they've been programmed, this series then is for them. Because part of what every survivor is going to wrestle with is ultimately, and we hear the idea of um, trauma bonding. So in a way, you are as stuck as the extent to which you are trauma bonded. But what I want people to understand is trauma bonded is actually half-baked healing. Trauma bonding means there's a part of you, it's a part of within the system, there are, part, there are parts that believe on some level that they cared, people did this, or if you could have just been good enough, it would have stopped that somehow either you deserved it or you brought it upon yourself or if you had been good enough, then it wouldn't have happened. And thinking about the idea of knapsacks, remember we've talked about knapsacks, okay? Every time a perpetrator harms a child, every time a perpetrator harms a child or an adult, let's say uh, by degree, right? You can do a lot of stuff to a lot of people they're taking, the perp is taking his or her responsibility to do what is right, to do what is just, to do what is fair. That's found in Proverbs chapter one and chapter two. Okay, that's 3,000 years old. That far predates psychology. So I'm going to go with ancient wisdom. It says, if we pray for wisdom, we'll know what is right, just, and fair. Our conscience will drive us to do what is right, just, and fair. It's, it's there to maintain that, maintain boundaries. To the extent that I'm not doing what is right, just, and fair, it means I am now 
taking my responsibility to treat someone with respect. And I am disregarding that. The act of doing that, it starts with an attitude, is me taking my knapsack, putting it on another person. So I can put my knapsack on someone. And when I do that, they'll feel it. I can manipulate someone, they'll feel it. Meaning I add weight in a way. It's really part of the weight is false responsibility. So I become an oppressor. So the goal of counseling, especially for a survivor, quite frankly, is to set them free. Set them free from what? Oppression. How do you set somebody free from oppression? That's They're enslaved. How do you do that? You get the knapsacks off. So every piece of truth is taking a knapsack that was placed on you and putting it back where it belongs. Lies, deception. Those are all knapsacks. And so I'm unburdening myself. I'm placing responsibility back where it belongs. I wasn't responsible for what I was given, but I'm responsible for what I do with that. And that, first of all, means that I have to be responsible with my emotions. So forget hurt people hurt people. We all tend to be reactive, but you know what? We need to stop being reactive. Because when I'm reactive, guess what I'm doing? I'm now putting my knapsack on somebody. So to really understand then what somebody was or wasn't responsible, and that's the goal of therapy in my estimation. Once I can figure out what was or wasn't mine, what I did or didn't do, what I was responsible for and what I wasn't, guess what's going to happen to the shame? Shame is false guilt. That goes. True guilt is specific to what I've done. So if I need to own something, I go own that. That's really step four in the 12 steps. Step four and five and six. But what perpetrators do is they layer on a survivor. They layer on the victim. Lie after lie while they're harming the kid. So we have to let the truth do its work. Get the knapsacks off. There goes the oppression. And the truth then sets the person free and they walk in freedom. And they're not bound by lies anymore. A key, if not the key issue, that every survival survivor on some level will always have to wrestle with. So it's really the bottom line issue. So when I'm working with someone, this is where I'm going with them, only helping them separate out knapsacks. But I want them to see the nature of the person that did this to them. Because the person that did this to them was tricking them in this sense. They were harming them, certainly. But they weren't honest about why they were harming them. They made the victim, they made the survivor believe it was something they were doing or not doing, meaning the victim. No perpetrator goes up to a kid and says, hey, I, I'm going to shove something up your anus because I want to. We're going to burn you because we want to. Um, we're going to do this stuff for years just that's because we want to. They're either going to have to kill the kid at some point, but if they don't kill the kid, they've actually disclosed what they're about. So it's only a matter of time until the kid does what? Discloses. Because then it's really clear, this person is bad. Now, perps will threaten, they'll do, they'll do, you know, they're going to gaslight, they're going to manipulate. But part of the manipulation somewhere in there is they're flipping the script and they're making the kid, they're making the victim feel guilty. Feeling as though they should have been able to stop it. Feeling as though if they had only been better. So it's these very subtle mind games. So no perp for very long, if they're going to keep the victim alive, no perp is going to be honest. 
and we're, we're screwing you in every orifice because we want to. Now, that just doesn't happen over a long period of time. They're gonna, they're always gonna play mind games with the kid. So the kid is left on some level, multiple levels, with parts of them feeling guilt. Because after all, the perp said what? If you'd just been better, we wouldn't have to do this to you. You know, this is what love is. This is okay. So the kid is left wondering. And then the parts, then the perps will will work on those different parts, trying to convince them or program them. So a big part of the key of healing, key to healing, the answer to this, as far as working through SRA, working through MK Ultra, is being able to see who they were and why they did what they did. Seeing the truth. Meaning who deserves these knapsacks? And if you can see that no matter what kind of kid you were, you never deserved that. And no matter what you were or were not going to do, they were going to do the exact same thing that they did regardless. And if it wasn't you, they would have taken another kid because they're evil and vile. That's all. Okay, that'll set off the nuclear explosions on the inside, by the way. That's pulling down every stronghold. Once that sinks in, trust me, all the shame, all the knapsacks are gone. So what we're doing is we're helping speak to that very important part during therapy. And we'll go back to the charts, but one of the key issues underlying all the chart that somebody will have to work through or a therapist is going to have to work through. So let's say we're working through the chart and we're, we will. But if you still don't understand or if a therapist still doesn't understand while we're looking at the chart, I have to know that the, the elephant in the middle of the room is who did this and why. And so that's why we're taking this little um, segue, or I'm sorry, we're kind of off ramp, or we're looking at this uh, part, which is uh, this, this subject matter, which is how does an adult get to the point where they can sadistically harm a child. Is it really possible that people could be this evil and therefore the people that were harmed, the victims, the survivors, were harmed by adults that wanted to do what they did and they were never going to do anything other than what they did because they intended to do it, because they got off on doing it, because they got high on doing it, because they're evil personified because they're pure psychopathy. Once a survivor realizes that, then guess what? Does a survivor have to feel trauma bonded? They have to feel loyal to that kind of person, knowing that they tricked you, deceived you, and they were never going to, you weren't their special thing. You weren't their little princess. You weren't the leader of the pack as they were doing the Hunger Games kind of thing. They were just using you. You let that sink in, I'll tell you what, you'll be free. Off will go those knapsacks. So that's why we're looking at how do you create a psychopath? Not that we want to, but how did they become the way they became? So that the trauma bonding falls away because there was nothing lovable about any of them. And it doesn't matter, it didn't matter how much you sacrificed yourself. They were never going to do anything other than what they did. They were never going to stop. And all they were concerned about as you grew up was making sure that you never disclosed so that they never went to prison. And maybe now you have a choice to finally have a voice. The hunted becomes the hunter. And that's what we're all about. That's what that's, that's what this is all about. So this series right now that we're doing is helping a survivor or helping family members 
the good kind of family members, right? Or helping decent pastors understand there is a level of abuse that some people have actually experienced that the vast majority of people can't comprehend. That was a very long introduction. So, so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a chart that we've been developing. I thought we would, by, by way of video introduction, help people understand that the idea of ritualistic abuse is a bona fide thing. Not only is it an actual category, but is now starting to be used in the public domain. And I want people to understand how this stuff can go on. Now, the survivors that are listening to you, Emma, and your station and us, they know. But there are some people that are tuning in that don't know. So we're going to look at a brief clip from a situation that is ongoing, has been for probably two, two and a half years now, the investigation, in Utah. It's already been some arrests. And there is strong indication that the district attorney is part of a pedophile ring, that others have been part of a pedophile ring. People in high places, positions of power and authority. Some, actually all of these happen to be connected to the Mormon church. I'm currently getting ready to do a series on the Catholic church. Again, anytime you have a structure where it has kind of a pyramid type of, you know, the higher leadership and it's kind of closed, that's a perfect opportunity for evil to start to take hold and they cover for one another. So whether in government, whether in religion, whether in education, whether in a business or a corporation, so psychopaths love that kind of thing. So we're going to look at the real situation that is unfolding now. And what I want people to hear is listen to what is described, listen to who is being implicated, the positions. And can you imagine being a survivor and thinking about coming forward with the positions that are being listed in this news report? How's that? Okay. So I will, without any further ado, we're going to listen to a, a news clip, and then we'll go into describing how these kinds of people come about. And we will, without any further ado. Learning more about the man arrested in Utah County on suspicion of ritualistic child sex abuse and his ties to Utah County Attorney David Levitt, who will not be allowed to prosecute this case. Fox 13 News investigative reporter Adam Kurbitz has tonight's update. Well, there are a number of reasons why the Utah County Attorney's Office might have a conflict of interest, not just because Levitt named himself as a suspect earlier this year. He's also given multiple statements about his relationship with Hamblin and some of the alleged victims. As you're about to see, the nature of those statements have changed over the past two years. Hey, would you mind driving in the back of the one step? Men and women allege David Hamblin used positions of power as a father, a therapist, a neighbor, and as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to ritualistically abuse children. He was arrested Wednesday morning, but investigators say he probably won't be the only one. I have nothing to hide. Until Hamblin's arrest, Fox 13 News chose not to identify any of the subjects of the investigation, but that did not stop Utah County Attorney David Levitt from outing himself as a suspect in June and describing his relationship with Hamblin. I prosecuted the therapist in Jeff County for poaching a deer. He poached a deer to use for ritualistic purposes. This therapist was my eldest born president in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was my neighbor. I had a family connection. During that same press conference, Levitt
some reason the sound cut off. I can't hear you for some reason. Oh, there we are. Sorry. I had played. Okay. okay, so there we are. Um, Emma, first of all, any thoughts or reaction about that? Yeah, I've been following that case. It's really disturbing, you know, and uh, I'm happy that it's being revealed because it's been a long time coming to expose Utah. But I mean, this is so prevalent, like it's disgusting. But I mean, it proves that this stuff does exist. You know, this case is getting a lot of attention, which is really good. Usually the stuff is kind of brushed under the rug, but it's like it's too big for people to ignore. So I'm really happy that it's being exposed there, you know, that and being able to see that network will hopefully allow people to see it forming and existing in other states and in other industries. And, you know, it just shines a bright light on the church and what they're doing behind the scenes. So according to Levitt himself, the it's pretty suspicious if you look at that description my oh my he was pretty casual well, how do you how do you how do you create how do you program so he even used the term that was interesting how do you program a kid give him rewards and look at look at it is how casually he said it there's a ton of stuff boy i'd love to be able to take that guy to this on the stand <laughs> but uh, so according to this guy who really looks suspicious based upon his own nonverbals, he's doing his nose thing. He's coming up very casually. He knows how to do it. How does somebody know how to do that? He even used the term programmed. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's not hard. And you're just like rolling over a dog. Teach. It's like, Whoa, buddy. I don't know. I've been working with survivors for a long time. I probably wouldn't have come across that casual. And how do you know it? And I don't. And he said, he's, known some victims so the fact that a suspicious character the da said it's real we now can put to rest any conspiracy that ritualistic abuse exists based upon the words of somebody that's very suspicious who would be high up so the da a county da connected to a church so there's the really the, the classic scenario that lends itself to ritualistic abuse, people in positions of power, small groups. Now, could they be large? Don't know. But they certainly are intelligent individuals that know what they're doing. So much so, look at how he came out with it. Oh, yeah, it's just like teaching a dog to roll over. He used the term programming. And he said it exists. So we'll take the words of somebody 
who is a DA who seems pretty suspicious in my estimation. So it's real. So now the question is, as we were looking at that guy and we're trying to fathom, is he a part of this? If so, how can I figure out, how can I mesh the guy that seemed so casual, pleasant, with somebody that's going to be so heinous as to do horrific things with blood and uh, satanic stuff behind the scenes. Because if he was involved, guess what he was like behind the scenes? Programming a child, roll over, give oral sex and stuff. So how does somebody get to a point? You know, am I saying that I know that is it? No, he's just pretty suspicious. Okay. But how, how does somebody get to a point where by day they can look so normal, so controlled, literally they control that he's not reactive. He started to get a little agitated apparently when the sheriff was, was saying stuff. But you don't become district attorney if you fly off the handle. You have to be trusted. You have to be capable a lot, of, a lot of people are, are then voted in to be judges after being DAs. So these are very normal looking individuals. By day, then by night, look at that therapist. So there's a therapist also connected with church. So look at all these labels that these people can wear. Look at how they can conduct themselves. By day, then he was talking about what? Levitt was, oh, the guy had deer hearts and blood and drinking blood. And, okay, that doesn't freak anybody out. That, that should be a concern. So we have that type of almost schizoid type of, it's a clinical term, but it's like, wait a second, this is a whiplash effect. So you mean to tell me somebody that can do really heinous stuff by night or behind closed doors can act perfectly normal, so normal that they run for political office? How do you do that? How do you get to a point where you can do the most heinous of things, including raping children, making them drink blood, pouring hot blood all over them, doing all sorts of heinous stuff, including murdering by night, and then put your coat and tie on the next day and nobody suspected. And you're providing cover because you're in a key law enforcement or prosecution. You know, So they have rings, they have people that they know where they're really protected. So they have dentists, they have doctors, they have um, teachers, then they have people in law enforcement. It's really the perfect circle. How does somebody get to that point where they can be so good in public, so heinous behind the scenes? That's what we're looking at. Because if a survivor can really see that it's true that somebody can be evil yet come across so smooth and that by the way is a sophisticated predator and levitt let's say he's guilty don't know really is suspicious though i can tell you what or that therapist and his wife by the way has also been charged she she's been picked up the wife of the therapist I can tell you they weren't abused as kids because they're too well put together and survivors ultimately are protective. Now, if a survivor has been programmed and was triggered into doing stuff, they're probably not listening to your program in a callous and indifferent way. Why is anybody listening to your program? Because something is resonating. Somebody who was never abused is not going to listen to your program other than to pick apart what you present to try to say this stuff doesn't happen. So it really is possible. And we're here now as we're going through a chart. We're going to look at, again, how does somebody get to this point? And with my work, uh, 15 years in a forensic, in different forensic settings, we're going to continue to look at how somebody gets to that point. How's that?
Emma, any thoughts or questions before we bring up the chart again? No, nope, go ahead. Okay. So, and we won't go on too long, or I won't go on. It's I'll own it. It's all me right, as I'm going through. But uh, that almost may be enough for people what we've shared already. But we're going to uh, pick up the chart. I'm going to, so here's our chart that we have been working our way through. And what I'm going to do is I want to show the entire chart if I can move my, I've got to move some things around so I can visually see it here. Okay, let me see if I can see the, I don't know how to, sometimes I make myself laugh with this tech stuff. There it is. Okay, because I, I want to shrink the whole chart so everybody can see what we're working with. So it's it's expanding each week. The reason why is because I'm adding more things each week. <laughs> okay. You can't read this. Don't worry. We're going to zoom in, but I recommend uh, people go back and watch the previous episodes because we have looked at these different levels or layers. These are really dynamics. All the degree of um, in intensity and premeditation, and then I've expanded a part of that down here. So we're going to look at that tonight. So I recommend go back, methodically listen to, or systematically listen to the different uh, episodes. Because where we ended last time, everybody watch your eyes. I'm going to scroll up. To this chart, but I've added to it. I'm just going to scroll up a little bit more so that people can kind of get a running start with this again. So on this chart, the way to read it is from left to right in terms of intensity. So low to high in terms of each of these different sections. So conscience with that, we would say, actually, that would be sensitive or less hardened. Okay, that uh, so they've they've moved from being sensitive to sluggish, but it's really low to high. In this case, when it comes to this red part, this is conscience, we would say, or I would say, this is a responsivity. How responsive is a person's conscience? So it's still somewhat, it, it's responsive a little bit, but it's becoming sluggish. So this is a conscience that still works all the way to right in here. This is conscience that no longer works. And as we've described in the past, and I will just draw a little, uh, a couple of things here. Those of you that were here uh, previously, you will recognize this. Uh, we go down to um, deviance. So we're going to look at degrees of deviant arousal. And that becomes really, let me see if I can do this. That becomes kind of our categories. Okay, maybe that's not exactly. And the best way to view this is we're looking at what does it take for someone to become the kind of person that is able to harm someone, especially sexually. And so the best way to view it is if you look at the gray, we're going to make those sort of, this is not equidistant, so everybody kind of bear with me. But we had this on a previous episode. Whoa, that's way off. Let's see if I can move that over. I don't know if I can move that over. Nope. Okay, well, kind of bear with me. <laughs> okay. And then here's another line. So we're going to pretend those are categories or on a scale of one to 10 kind of thing. Somewhat in there. Okay. So you guys know what I'm trying to get across. There we go. So as someone moves from one category to the next, these are not straight. I should have prepared at a time. So let's just kind of go with this. So looking down here at, um, this category right there. There we go. Okay. I tried to break it into sections. That's not equal distance or it really should be per line here. Okay. That really as goes somebody's deviant arousal or as somebody's deviance increases. And it's also down here in the gold, by the way. Uh, so these are really going to be some of the key aspects uh, and the same thing with objectification. So the key in sex, uh, sexual offending is deviance. If you've been with us, you would remember that deviance is very different than lust. It's polar opposite. Lust has to do with uh, selfish attraction, but it's visually being stimulated by uh, something that is appealing. And it usually, uh, for men, it's going to be an adult female. 
even for a 10 year old boy, 15 year old boy. But by the time somebody gets into deviance, where somebody, a guy that's into lust will get an erection based upon visual stimulation, what he sees, deviance is a guy is getting an erection over degree of harm. Lust has to do with mood, as it were. Deviance has to do with degree of trauma. As somebody, as a guy moves into deviance, he's no longer normal. He's becoming a predator. So you can see how it, it can happen very uh, early and quickly. We described how the continuum of sexual objectification, so as he is viewing someone more and more as an object, then the type of arousal and what's motivating him, it's changing. So you can really, if these were equidistant, right? Um, you could just go to one category and work your way down. That's what we've looked at in the past. We also looked at uh, the kinds of offenses and what somebody is into by the time they get arrested and then after they do their plea deals. So really what these kind of represent prior to uh, plea deals. And then we also looked at the kinds of pornography that somebody is into by the time they are in these different categories. And a huge concern should be guys that are into kink and BDSM, guess what they're looking at behind the scenes? Guys that are dressing in drag in order to push limits. You have guys that dress in drag that stay in clubs, okay, so be it. But guys that are dressing in drag in order to come out into the open, meaning to push boundaries uh, with women and kids, uh, men in women's sports, men in uh, women's prisons, drag queen story hour, um, guys going to elementary schools, guys going into planet fitness, self-IDing as women, look what also they're into. Okay, so these are very dangerous guys. They're just playing the public for fools. Then we continued on down and you can kind of see the same categories, but I'm now going to get rid of the little white lines. That's different than a white line, right? I'm going to get, if I can, let me see if I can do this just because, I don't know, maybe I'm being anal retentive. Nope. Okay. We're going to not do that. Hold on. We're going to bring that back. Oh, I bet I can do this. No, I can't. Okay. Bear with me, everyone. Let's see <laughs> if, I'm... okay, there we are. Oh, you know what? It does kind of change a little bit. Oh, okay. Well, bear with me, even though that's not exactly, maybe I'm being I'm typically not anal retentive. Okay. Meaning just all to, that. Maybe say, just enlarge it a little bit more. Okay. You're very smart. That'll help. That, yeah. You're very good. Okay. So here we go. We're now going to pick up where we left off. Woo. Okay. Think in terms of the white lines. That's kind of the idea of categories again. Now, what we were looking at, and I added a little more to this, is when a guy is becoming deviant, there's a growing degree of intensity and premeditation. Intensity is going to be the energy with which he is propelled to do what he's doing. Premeditation, how much forethought. Now, there's also a little bit of difference, and I'll define that here in a second, but forethought is... He gave it some thought, premeditation. Now, again, they can be uh, semantics. This can be semantics. But I also want people to, to know, and hopefully this will be helpful, what I mentioned last time was, since I deal with sex offenders still, I'm one of South Carolina's largest sex offender treatment providers. I've been working with men who have offended for 15 years, 11 of which were in the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. Okay, When I do my assessments, now, I haven't actually done forensic assessments for a while because I don't have the time. Now, I do risk assessments, a little bit different, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back out of this just for a second again, right there, okay? I want people to have a sense of what goes through my mind when I'm sitting down with a guy or as I'm working with a guy. For purposes of public safety and for purposes of me assessing the extent to which the guy is sorry, issues of remorse, issues of contrition, which has to do with conscience, okay? If I, on behalf of society, is working with a guy or am working with a guy, 
I would imagine John Q. Public wants me to, so the average citizen wants me to make sure that bad guys are not let loose. Now on parole, it's a little bit different. They're actually back in society, they're under supervision, but you still want me to be able to give information to the parole officer that we have a problem. And so what goes through my mind and as I'm giving parole officers feedback these days in my monthly reports, as well as the overall um, summary reports and what I was doing in the Department of Corrections, these were the various things. Now, of course, the amount of jail time or the sentence structures, those were fixed. But the rest of these are very dynamic. And you're never going to get at this in a three-hour interview. Now, think about the average academic researcher. It takes a long time to be able to, if you're working in a college, if you're a college professor and you're going to do interviews, it takes a long time, four to six months, oftentimes, I think, to be able to interview, um, to line up the interviews. And then the question is, how long do you have? You probably have about three hours. Well, think about the kinds of people we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who are the world's greatest liars because they have the world's least amount of conscience, okay? So oftentimes what the perps are doing, especially the pedophiles, is when they are interviewed by academic, um, by academics, they know that the academic is going to publish a paper. Why is the academic going to do that? Only it's to, they're trying to achieve a purpose. The, um, let's say the instructor or the college professor, that material the findings of that research are, is going to be used because this is forensic material. This is dealing with the law, um, crimes. Oftentimes, the material is going to be used to influence public opinion, public policy, sentencing structures, meaning the, the range that a judge has as far as what's available to him. Can he give how much from what to what? Five to 15, five to 20. Then it becomes judicial discretion. Are certain things mandatory as far as laws? Uh, strike three law uh, may come to mind. Three strikes you're out in California. I don't know if they still have that, okay? So it really is important. If somebody is interviewing an inmate, interviewing a, a sex offender, you need to be able to get at these various facets because they will form a profile and ultimately they're gonna fall into these different equidistant categories, okay? So you wanna find out to what extent is the guy a low risk, genuinely a low risk or a high risk. Now for purposes of the series we're doing, Emma, what we're doing, what I'm doing is laying out for survivors. How could somebody end up harming a child in such a way that by day they look normal, by night or behind closed doors, they do abject evil things? And was there anything that the child could have done to have stopped it, assuaged the person? That's why we're doing this. So we're going to look at, as you all have probably been staring at it, we're looking at now degree of intensity and premeditation. I added a couple of things, but in this chart, I wanted to differentiate for the viewer the difference between the serial rapist murderer that is the lone wolf or the group of random sadistic individuals. And those have a higher degree of arrest rate. Was that proper? <laughs> they're, they're the ones that are going to be more times than not because they make stupid um, mistakes. They, they leave clues behind. As a matter of fact, with the serial rapist murderers, a lot of them will do what with law enforcement? They will start to taunt. Okay. So the people on the top, as we're going to go through this, will taunt they are sloppy, they are impulsive. The ones on the bottom are hidden. By day, they are district attorneys, they are judges, they are professors, they are psychologists, they are church leaders. But by night, 
they are diabolical. So by nature, you have two different populations to first in understanding sex offenders, but especially sadistic kind, because we're talking about, I'm going to scroll down. We're talking about those that are, I'm going to scroll down a little bit more because we're going to get into that one. Okay. We're talking about psychopaths. So how do you create a psychopath? And my contention, contention is, as I go back up, watch your eyes, is that psychopaths are not born. It's not nature, nurture, genetics. It's not um, neurostructures. Those all play a role, but it always comes down to conscience. Okay, So you have two primary populations within the sadistic adult males. They're going to harm kids in horrific ways. So we're going to look at the top portion. We're going to look at what I would just kind of categorize as highly impulsive. Okay, Th these are not the, the scientific ones, which we're going to look at down here. Okay, so these are not the ones that have been employed for a long period of periods of time, progressively moving up the corporate ladder. Um, or positions of trust. So the DA, uh, president of the United States, um, and I'm not talking about the current president, I'm just, uh, okay, president of countries, head of the CIA, NSA, or uh, what was the CIA, um, head of church or church structure, churches, um, uh, World Health Organization, right? Meaning really big organization, aid organizations, okay? Very different than the lone law student like Ted Bundy. By nature, very different. So how do you create a Ted Bundy? How do you create a, a, a gang of guys that are going to rape um, a developmentally disabled teenager? We're going to show you now. So they all start off as opportunistic. What do I mean by that? Prior to them becoming sadistic, they were once guys that an opportunity came their way opportunity in what way typically through porn okay now that's going to be over here because think about loss so i should draw another line this blue line by the way differentiates legal versus illegal okay now the rest of this meaning look they're into all this activity is illegal how many of these guys down here get busted very very few how many get busted here uh, more than not. Okay, so the blue differentiates left side is legal, right side is Ill illegal activity, whether the guy gets busted or not. So look at over on the far left, we're into on this chart, we're into guys that are now allowing themselves to actively act upon their lust. How do you do that in this day and age? One key factor is in this day and age for the past 40 years, they're into pornography. The issue ultimately is going to be deviance, but how do you fast track deviance? What's the rocket fuel? What's the, how do you supercharge it? It is pornography. 100% of everybody to the right of this line is deeply steeped in pornography prior to crossing this line. And 100% of pedophiles are busted with child rape porn and to get into child rape porn, let me go back up for a second, watch your eyes. To get into child porn, you've already gotten into what? Okay, 100% of the time. Do not fall for what those that are uh, use the idea of minor attracted persons or uh, um, what harmless pedophiles or whatever term that James Canner and others want to push, Michael Bailey, both men are extremely deviant. Yeah, how can I say that? You know, uh, well, Michael Bailey, as an instructor, as a professor for Northwestern University, had again had a um, demonstration, live demonstration in his class, where um, after class uh, the students could stick around, and here came a man and a woman, and the woman disrobes, and the man puts a dildo on on a power tool like a a jigsaw. I think, I, you know, puts it on there and puts it inside her and fires it up. That's really deviant. And that, quite frankly, it fits over here. Look at look at over here. Dismemberment. What do I think? 
when I hear that a man inserted a power tool, a dildo tipped power tool inside of a woman, I think of dismemberment. Well, he didn't cut, who's gonna do that? Okay, so I can tell you what that kind of person's been watching. How do I know? Because after they get busted, guess what you find? Okay, so we're gonna go back down now. So we're gonna look at, again, kind of everything from the lone wolf to the impulsive group that do heinous stuff, senseless stuff, all of it is senseless, but there's no method to their madness. So that's why to the um, to this top part, I'm just gonna use the term impulsive. Okay, it doesn't mean they can't be self-controlled. Think about Ted Bundy. He was methodical. Think about um, Dennis Rader, BTK killer. Uh, there was they were methodical, but still they're driven by impulse. Okay, and that's why they start out opportunistic. It's starting out with low-grade pornography. It's progressing, so they're open to opportunities that come their way, but they're not really creating the opportunity. So this is a low-level guy. As a matter of fact, he hasn't crossed legal lines. This could be the guy that, including the teenager that is open to opportunities because he's been looking at pornography. If he's a teenager or a child, he's being groomed or he happened upon the pornography. And then all of a sudden he starts to get hooked on it. And I wanna, as a matter of fact, let me tell you about the degree of intensity, this middle line, because then we're gonna expand this. He's opportunistic here. He finds the Playboy. He, well, now it's not even Playboy, right? He goes online. It used to be the kid finds the dad's Playboy, but now he's he's online. And what does he find? He's on TikTok. What does he find? He's, he finds sissy porn. He finds all sorts of stuff now, right? So he's he's an open opportunity waiting to happen. And therefore, he's going to find pornography and even look up here. What uh, degree of deviant arousal? It's impulsive and egocentric. So it's very much, he's not acting out yet. He's just consuming the stuff. Well, eventually, he's now going to start to frequent these sites and he's going further. Now it's anime. Now it's hentai. Now it's, so it's progressing. Um, he's now looking at kink stuff. He's looking at men choking women. Well, what starts to happen? Under the surface, it's starting to hook him. Think about fishing in the book of James, if anybody's familiar with it. It says that we're tempted by lust and we're drawn away, a guy is drawn away, a person. So think about a fish, uh, you bait the kind of, um, you use the kind of bait that you're looking for, the kind of fish. And so Satan comes along, he's gonna bait this guy and the guy chomps down and now, or he's being lured. The book of James actually use, I'm sorry, uses that word. So we're drawn away, we're lured and that pulls him over and then the fish does what? Chomps down and now he's hooked. And now he's hooked and what happens? So something now, he's sort of in control, but what's happening now? It's moving, so up here we might liken it to Niagara River way upstream. But if you begin to float the same water that is leisurely up here starts to take on some power. And the further you move toward Niagara Falls, that which you were maybe in control of starts to take control of you for guys. Okay, so we'll say that on the inside, we could even say spiritually, so to speak, it's being drawn away and then he's hooked. So he bites in here. He's been nibbling and now he's bite, he bites and now he's hooked. He's invited stuff into his life and now he's being pulled. Think of a fisherman, right? He's hooked and now he's pulling. And now what happens within the guy is something starts to take over and move him. So with power on the inside, now I'm not gonna say the guy's demon possessed, but guess what? He, he's really opening himself up. As a matter of fact, let's scroll up. Let's find out what kind of, there we go. Look at what kind of porn he's into. Triple X and worse, there's hentai, deviant, zoophilia. So he's already starting to introduce what? 
bestiality. And so it very much could be he's already into some of this, but we certainly know he's really into deviant stuff. I'm going to scroll down again. So look at what's going on on the inside of him. He's not just hooked. He's not just pulled, but now something is propelling him. It's almost like he's got a little propeller behind him. So he's he something is acting on him with power. And this comes out of the Book of Romans, this term. Okay, given over in the book of Romans chapter one, it talks about how God gave them over and he says it three times. Now, this word has to do with in a courtroom situation when the perpetrator is found guilty, the criminal is found guilty, gavel comes down and the judge turns to the officer and says, take him away. Cuffs are put on and the, the guilty uh person stands up and he's led away out of the courtroom. That's this picture. And what happens is God takes the guy, the restraint off of this guy, and he's given over to what he wants. And now this guy starts to feel relief. I want you to see, I'm going to scroll up now. Let's see where his conscience is. Okay. He's now into deviant stuff. So he's already changing into a predator. He is now calloused, has a callous conscience, and he's cauterizing. He's only a few categories away from a non-functional conscience. I'm going to scroll back down. So this takes a lot of work because his conscience is trying to bring him back. And he's overriding, 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 and getting into worse stuff at the same time. By the time he's given over that last time, which where is that? Who knows? But there's a line beyond which. There's a point of no return. And what does that look like for this guy? That he'll never have the want to, to ever want to be any other way than what he is. He wants more and he never will ever want to come back because he doesn't value it anymore. And therefore, and this is the twisting zone right in here. And therefore, what used to be right and wrong, good and bad now are inverted. So he's given over, and if you've ever met somebody like that, if they've ever been honest, right? Because deception is the art of deception is increasing the whole time. They think coming back to the way you used to be, the way he used to be, he thinks it's stupid. It's a joke. He'll say, "Oh, you know what? You're nothing but a Boy Scout." So he calls people over here Boy Scouts, but it's a it's not a flattering thing. You know, people over here they want to be Eagle Scouts, right? Over uh, the further you go over to the right, not only do they make fun of it, but then it's a pejorative term. And as a matter of fact, the further right you go, you actually want to cause harm to Boy Scouts. So you're changing. So by the time somebody is given over, they're losing the desire ever to come back. God has given them over because they've hardened their conscience. So if God doesn't intervene, what's ever going to be there to bring them back? So it really is a miracle. If anybody, so if any of you are listening, I had a gentleman reach out to me uh, this past week saying that he started to get really worried because he started to kind of see what uh, pornography he was into. And he's starting to wonder, you know what? That's a gift of God. Because if, he didn't have a conscience left, guess what? He wouldn't wonder, right? He wouldn't be bothered. He would never call somebody up possibly for counseling saying, you know what? I think I've seen how far I have slept. No, because if somebody's given over, they'll never have those thoughts again. Okay. Think about Niagara river over on the left, Niagara falls on the right. We're now getting closer to the falls and something now is starting to propel the person. So there's no resistance anymore. When a fish gets hooked, it's fighting, it's being pulled in, and now all of a sudden it's like he has a propeller. And now what happens? So we're talking the degree of intensity behind the crimes. This person is now given over. They are now inverted. They are like a fighter jet that went into a cloud bank. They are upside down. What used to be right, wrong, good, bad is now inverted. And now look. Now they're on a mission, so to speak. The degree of intensity, they're no longer putting the brakes on. Now they're starting to double down on the gas pedal. They're propelled and then they're driven. 
and then an insatiable appetite, obsessed, and then possessed, literally or figuratively. If we've ever, you've ever heard the term, man, what got into you? What's what's come over you, man? It's like you're you're possessed by some. Okay, so but also literally. So a gradation, one to ten. This is under the surface surface what's driving the guy now. Let's find out the kind of uh, planning. Yeah, there you go. And premeditation. So again, we're talking first. We're going to go back at this level. Remember, he's not driven. He's still kind of has a conscience here. So he's he's still bothered a little bit. But now, first opportunities were coming his way, and now. He's kind of positioning himself in a way where he's open to opportunities. He's being an idiot. Okay. So we would say that's impulsive. He's not thinking any longer. So now where temptation and opportunity came his way, now, so you know, let's say I'm going to make this up. Um, a guy goes to college. He's part of a fraternity. And before you know it, girls have visited him and... Um, somehow, right, he ends up in bad, and he's starting to also get it. And I'm not blaming the woman, okay? But this this could also be mutual, right? We talked about ethical versus um, immoral. But he starts to do it more often. But now he's starting to, there's a little bit of thought going in. So he's now going to position himself, pardon the pun, but now he's going to make himself available because it's like, you know what? Yeah, I could get used to this. And even down there, see, it's habitual. So this is a guy that wasn't trying to create opportunity. This guy now is pretty open to opportunity and maybe starting to actually uh, look for it. Okay. So what's happening inside of him? That now he's drawn. And what you're going to find is he moves from impulsive to, there we are. You look at his porn use. And now he's actively seeking it out. And then what happens? Now we're at a crossroads, by the way. We're going to find out what kind of offender, because now he's crossed legal lines, by the way. What kind of offender are we going to have? If he continues upward, he's going to be the isolated lone wolf kind. But then what kind? We'll find out. So He's still staying by himself because he's either going to be alone, driven, or he's going to connect with others in random or opportunistic fashion by degree. So he's either going to start to go online and find other guys. He's uh, in college and he's starting to find other guys. So he's either going to do what he's doing. Um, so as it's getting down here, this would be the gang rapes. It's the beginning of them right in here, quite frankly, okay, with other guys. This is by himself. This guy actually will drink by himself. This guy, right, it, it, it really comes down to, is he doing this by himself or is he doing this with others? And then birds of a feather. So this is the lone vulture um, or a predator, a bird of prey. This is a flock. That's pretty good. Okay. So he's going to go from driven to, we're going to see, how do you create a Ted Bundy? How do you create a, a BTK, BTK killer? How do you create the individual serial killer? Okay, we're going up here. He's driven. And then because of the intensity, he's hooked and now he's pulled. There's something that's starting to come over him. Yeah, am I going to go as far as, go so far as to say possession? No, but... Is it reasonable to think that he may be inviting darker forces, as it were, into his life? Yes, it is. And what's happening is this. He's now becoming porn addicted. He's not only driven, but now he's he's finding that his thought life, this is taking up all his thought life. And now what's happening? A formerly somewhat self-controlled individual, because think about what else. I mean, he's doing illegal stuff by this time. So he's also, as a matter of fact, one of the categories, and we'll look at this next time, what are the categories of psychopathy? They talk in terms of drugs and alcohol. So this kind will be actively using. And therefore, it's really a holistic picture going on. This guy 
is now driven. Look what's happening with his thought life. What are happening with his grades or what is happening with his grades, by the way, or his work attendance, right? It's starting to show itself because he's being ultimately given over. So this thing is taking a much more significant, is playing a much more significant role. Ideally, he's going to see what he's been doing. Now he's crossing legal lines, but let's say he hasn't gotten busted. It really should be in here, um, Sexaholics Anonymous, but maybe uh, prostitution, he's visiting prostitutes in here, probably also in here. Uh, so let's say he doesn't get busted for going to prostitutes. Let's say he went one time and he realizes, oh my gosh, I, I've got to stop. So he then calls for help. He's going to go to um, Sexaholics Anonymous. Okay. And so he's going to have to fight now the addiction because he's hooked. We use that term when it comes to addiction. Okay. So the difference, by the way, between a porn addict versus a predator is right up here in a way, or the, the porn addict, it's going to try to apply the brakes. So some will have tried here, uh, some won't. So you can have those that became porn addicted, um, where he tried to resist. Ted Bundy, it sounds like he didn't really try to resist, and they both w would go that way. Okay, and so he's becoming more erratic. Um, because his whole life is changing. He's he's now staying up. He's doing binging on porn. He's now accessing the dark web and he's binging. So he's affecting all of his life. So he goes from erratic. Think about the people that know him. He may be around people, but he's starting to withdraw. People are starting to not recognize him as far as the friends that he may have had here, even in the frat house. They're starting to notice he's isolating and he's just, he's starting to look like a rack or he's starting to not be able to carry on normal conversations. He just seems flighty. They have noticed a change and so he is isolating himself. He's withdrawing. Eventually he may choose to just move out of the frat house. He now gets an apartment off campus. Okay, so we can see he's already, though, still connecting with others. So he may go rent an apartment with who? These kind of people. So he moves out of the frat house and in with other people, or he's by himself, but he's connecting with guys online. He's connecting with other categories of guys. Um, they're going to furry uh, uh, conventions, right? They're doing deviant stuff. They're doing drag queen story hour. So deviant guys are starting to hang around with other deviant guys. However, up here, he's, he's becoming much more isolated. And now his actions are random in a lot of different ways. And he's also now looking for um, victims in a very random way. So right now, um, he could do... He could be into snatch and grab already a little bit, um, but it's probably going to be he goes to the bar and he's looking for opportunities and he doesn't have too much of a plan. So it's somewhat random. All he knows is whoever comes up to him, um, he's going to uh, take her to his place. He's already deviant. So guess what he's going to do to her? He's already going to harm her in a pretty significant way. As a matter of fact, look at how illegal. So he's going to rape her. Um, certainly date rape kind of stuff. Now, look at, we went from random to he's going to start to select his victims, right? There is such a significant difference because now you really are a, pre a guy is truly a predator because now he's lying in wait. He's starting to plan. There's a different degree of planning and look what's going over, going on over here. He's being given over and he's being propelled. So now he's no longer trying to put the brakes on and now he's developing plans to access, including if, uh, now I'm not a predator, I know how they think. So if I'm a predator, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm actually going to join Planet Fitness right now. Why? Because they have made it public that they allow guys in there who self-ID. So if I'm a perp, I have no, you think I have morals? So I have no problem walking in 
And as a matter of fact, there was a guy that was not in drag. He looked like a normal guy, but he quote unquote self ID'd. So I'm going in with a cell phone. When I'm in there, I'm starting to um, identify, right? I'm, I'm figuring out who these people are. Maybe before I go into the women's room, I've got my plan. So for the first couple of months, I'm just going to get to know people. I'm going to hang around the cashier so I can begin to hear names. So I'm starting to lie in wait. That's a really, I mean, this guy's a predator now. Now the question is what kind of predator? We're either going to go into just flat out hum, uh, fallen human nature that isn't going to deal with, overtly, is not going to deal with satanic stuff. Now, trust me, it's all satanic, right? The spirit behind it versus I'm going to entertain and interact with dark forces. So BTK killer, Dennis Rayner, Raider called, uh, he said he became aware of Factor X. Somebody like a Ted Bundy, obviously propelled by the same spirit, there it is, propelled and driven, but I don't ever recall Ted Bundy talking about a spiritual dynamic to it. These guys will then, either one, so something comes over them. Oh, something will still come over them, but a, a qualitative difference. So um, Dennis Rader knew that Factor X was in his life. And so when, when Dennis Rader would start to look for trophies, and this is very much accessing women's underwear, he may go to laundromats, uh, this actually, he could be hurting somebody and still getting trophies, but this is going to be uh, trinkets and photos, those kinds of things. Um, here is not, again, so much think about Ted Bundy. He's not hearing uh, overtly from demons. He's just becoming much more cold hearted, possibly also accessing trophies. But there seems to be more of a, well, now I, I think about that Canadian Air Force colonel. And he certainly had uh, trophies, women, women's underwear. Okay, so in one way or another in here, both are probably going to end up with trophies. So if you hear a guy that has women's underwear, how do we know he purchased them? And the question is, is it just a fetish or is it a dark fetish? My contention is the vast majority of guys that have women's underwear, they are not purchasing them. It's up to them to prove it. They are stealing this underwear. Very dangerous by that time. Now, both are, I didn't have space in here, so I'm going to use this ritualistic. This isn't necessarily, again, dealing with crosses and religious trappings right here. Okay, that's going to be down here. What this has to do with is more methodical and premeditated and they're going through the motions, but it certainly also had like the the uh, clip that we watched: ritualistic abuse, drinking blood. I mean, it can include that. Okay, bloodlust. The reason I mentioned that is that word just means this guy is now has a fervor about him. And look at down here: insatiable appetites. The word bloodlust doesn't necessarily have to be literal. But it means, I mean, think about the word, okay? So a, a huge degree of intensity. Okay, now we're going to go back up to the lone wolf kind of guy. Uh, Dennis Rader, once he gets his victims, there's subjugation and sedation. Ted Bundy did not sedate his victims. Not that um, Dennis Rader always sedated them. But there's going to be a degree of a lack of struggle in one way or another, and a little bit different, not that it always has to be this way, but here there's going to be a struggle, and this guy gets off on the struggle. As a matter of fact, there, random hookups and cruising. So women, beware. Do not do hookups. I'm telling you, you don't know who you're getting in the vehicle with. Okay, the goal of the guys up here is to do what with the victim? Right. And that's why, ladies, if some guy's grabbing you in a vehicle, you have to fight. 
because you're probably never going to be seen again. Okay, so bloodlust and then crazed, and then you're going to tend to see one of two things, depending upon the psyche of the guy and what's come over him. This is, the guy looks maniacal. If the survivor ever, uh, if somebody survives, if they find a survivor alive after they find a bunch of victims anyways, so a serial rapist murderer, they will say that his eyes looked crazed. Down here, they will say he just, he just wanted to, uh, you know, he was, oh, he was cold and methodical. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Freddy Krueger, I think if I'm using those terms, right? right? A little bit, actually big difference. So this guy has the crazed look. This guy has the methodical look, but they're both firing up a power tool as, they, as they're dismembering, okay? Big difference in a way. I mean, the end result's going to be the same, but a different psychological profile, okay? These are the lone wolves. Eliminate the goal is to eliminate the victim. Okay, now we're going to go back to where oh, we're down here. Sorry, okay. The trophies we're, we're talking about the guy who oh, subjugation and um, sedation. You notice up here, these perpetrators are not sedating the victim. This guy's going to use some form of sedation, so there isn't. As he's firing up the power tool, the person's already dead or they're asleep. Somehow there's not going to be the struggle. This guy gets off on the struggle, these two different kinds of guys. This is going to sedate them and then kill them, strangle them while they're sedated, and then we'll dismember them. These two guys want the victim to watch themselves. They want the victim to watch themselves being killed. Here, the uh, predator... Um, just once, uh, this is what's doing it for the the perp, okay? It's the killing, and then they will dismember them without a struggle, okay? Or without the person's eyes being open. Here, the victim's eyes are open. Here, they are not conscious, okay? But again, lone wolf kind of thing, selecting and tracking in the prey. It tends to be a different. This is that random guy. This is the Ted Bundy. This is the BTK killer. This is going to be more tracking the prey. Find a woman, and then he's going to start to find out about her. This is, you pull up, grab somebody in the car. Okay. Uh, we're now down to, we're going to go back to where there's more than one perpetrator, two or more. This is all one, a single perpetrator. This is now a collection of guys, two or more. So the guy's been connecting with and uh, right they he's interacting with groups it could be just one uh, perpetrator an additional perpetrator or more and there's a jackal pack you've heard of wolf pack these are a bunch of jackals they're not very sophisticated because that's not what's driving them so the thrill of the hunt it's not the methodology, but the trauma that they're after. And then you look at what they do. Senseless, impulsive gang sadism, where they may allow the, uh, oftentimes these guys will allow the victim to stay alive. These guys are going to eliminate the victim and the victim will never be heard from again. These are the 12 guys that gang raped the intellectually disabled teenager and then let her go. Okay, this is the gang rape on the college campus kind of stuff. But the kind of stuff they're doing is heinous. So they're using objects. Um, they're uh, debasement. I mean, you can go up, right? We're going to have subject, uh, subjugation, defilement, desecration. Um, will, will each of these guys use religious symbol uh, symbolism? Could be. BTK killer, um, Ted Bundy. Jeffrey Dahmer didn't use a lot of religious symbolism. Okay. So they can't, they may or may not. Okay. But if somebody is demon possessed, more than likely they will. Okay. Think about the intensity. So the intensity, there's going to be the same degree of intensity, but now we're going to go to the wolf pack. 
We're going to go to a different kettle of fish. We're going to go to a different animal now. We're going to go to the SRA MK Ultra. And you create that a different way. Has degree of planning, but instead of it being more and more impulsive and erratic, what happens? Starts out the same way. And then, so it's lust, but, it, but eventually it's not so much impulsive because again, remember going this way, it's the person starts to isolate himself until he finds other deviants. Here is this person is being drawn in, but likely he's drawn in by other guys. Other uh, others that are into it. So this is going to be kind of the initiation, we might say. The difference between the lifestyles of people up here and the lifestyles of people down here, a lot of drugs and alcohol in more of a an abusive way, meaning uh, co-occurring disorders, okay? Here, it's much more sophisticated. Down here, they are employed in respectable jobs. Here, it's the lone wolf kind of thing, the, the independent contractor kind of thing. Doesn't mean that they aren't um, employed sometimes in, in normal jobs, but oftentimes we might say they have 1099s, right? Independent contractors here, they're entered into, they're hired in the firm. They're elected into certain positions or they'll run for positions, but here it's kind of the good old boy network. So they're starting to find that as they move their way up, this is, we could, uh, let's say the Masonic Lodge. Uh, this is where they start to get um, accepted into the church by the elder board. What, you know... So this, again, more organized. This is the faculty or certain faculty are starting to um, invite this person over to their house. This was Kinsey. Kinsey was down here. So he would bring faculty onto you know, the University of Indiana and little by little. So here's manipulative. So it's not just manipulating a victim, but he would do that. Think about what Kinsey would do. He would um, hire different guys and uh, a guy that was married, and then he would make him compromise. He would do wife swapping. He would uh, take photographs. And so the victim is being manipulated and the other men, right? Little by little, they are getting initiated or there's dirt being um, pulled, uh, being um, garnered, okay? How about Epstein Island? Very much, right? So Epstein would probably get to know them, invite them to dinner parties. Um, and then little by little, at some point in time, hey, do you want to take a uh, come to my island? How about Bohemian Grove, right? So how do you know if somebody's truly, the, they're going to go uh, two times or more, right? So if somebody went to Epstein Island one time, why didn't they go back? Probably because maybe it was over here and the guy thought, what the heck is this guy all about? I mean, the would-be initiate, initiant, maybe it's over here, but he gets away. Maybe he doesn't really know what Bohemian Grove is. Maybe he was told, how about the entertainment? Uh, as far as bands, I heard there were some uh, people that would play entertainment, but before you know it, they're shocked by what they're seeing. Okay, so these guys will then back out. So this is a screening process as well. So by the time you're here, you're not only hooked, but now you're liking it. So we could say with the entertainment industry, how about Hollywood? You can see what happens. And so by the time you get here, you're part of the, you're, you're in, in a way. By the time you're here, you're really in. Okay, so the more you get in on this level, you're becoming, first of all, you probably have a higher and higher IQ. That's probably what they're screening out. That's safe to say, right? Because up here, it doesn't take a high IQ. Here, it takes a high, high IQ. And that's what they're uh, 
those that are screening, so these are all these levels are being screened by who? People over here. Because the people over here are the ones that are looking for new initiants. Big difference, right? Because the lone um, jackals, the lone wolves up here, they don't have anybody, all things being equal, these the impulsive ones. So they don't, you don't have people here that are telling a guy, hey, we want to be part of our group. But here... These are the, oh, sorry. Oh, let's have him go back here. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So this is why in the Masons, the 33rd degree Masons and all that. So you have the more experienced, the firm, whatever term, right? So these are the senior members that these will eventually get to know early on. And so they start to see the benefit of hanging in there and seeing, uh, you know, how high up in the organization they can go. Because these perps are using sex and sexuality, meaning by this time, look at what's happening. They're eventually getting deviant, the same inner dynamic, the person's being given over, but now it's, it's combined with intellect and a methodical approach. There we are, methodical. Okay, so this is very much, we can see how this would lead into experimentation kind of stuff. This is, there you go. Think about Kinsey. Kinsey would find his potential faculty members, but meanwhile, what's where is Kinsey in terms of deviance? He's over here. He's coming across just like Jeffrey Epstein was over here. But he's not letting these new prospects, he's not letting them know what is in store for them. So they're, they're screening. So the perps on the far right are screening out and screening in. So that by the time somebody is able to pass through these different levels, they've gotten to a point where they have transgressed their conscience now they're given over and now they want it. Here, they're not quite sure. They're investigating and they're still going, I don't know if I should, well, okay. Well, it's not, well, you know, one time won't hurt. Maybe that's up here. Yeah, right. And before you know it, yeah, I can get into this. And as a matter of fact, dang, that wasn't bad. And look at the perks and man, they seemed, we did that last night, but these guys seem really normal. And okay, I think I'm in there. So before you know it, and so look at the tactics that are used. So eventually, once the perps have the guy here, not only do they have the goods, so they probably gotten the goods on him right in here. So the blackmail stuff, in case the guy decides to try to, so he's already compromised in here. I Meaning um, here's the ethical and moral compromise. Yeah, you got legal goods on him here. Okay, so also think about the Playboy Mansion was probably in here. A married guy is going to bed with an adult woman who's a playmate. Okay, but Epstein Island, you got kids, you got minors. Okay, big difference. But by the time somebody has let go of the worry of that and they're in there, now they want it more. And they're getting promoted. They're starting to see real benefits and their deviant is all get out. And they are learning the art of being one way by day and another way by night, that takes a degree of intellect. And so the screening process is taking place. And then eventually what's going to happen? Bohemian Grove. I know I set it up here, but probably, maybe they go to Be Bohemian Grove the first time and not a lot takes place. But once they start to get into real stuff like that Levitt was talking about, blood, uh, deer hearts, you notice he said deer hearts and blood and then blood. Uh -huh. He used he used blood twice, kind of interesting. And then it's going to turn what? Inside of them, now they're turning dark. Of course, it was all getting dark, but now it's really dark. And this is the real realm of sadism. And this is all, think about, we've got deviance here. Deviance is about the negative effect. 
but this is the BDSM kind of stuff. And but here it's now very much dark, traumatizing stuff. And look at the degrees of complex trauma that's happening to the victim. Um, this was just my way of trying to show there's a lot of trauma and then profound trauma. Uh, we could even I could even say that this will be degrees of dissociation. You know, that's not a bad way of putting it. I'm gonna scroll down just a little bit more. So the perpetrator's deviant sexual interest goes from lust to, you know, just kind of given over to lust, to harm, to all of a sudden now it's really sadistic and dark. Okay, so it's going to match. And then what is the goal of the more methodical uh, group of people, of predators? They're in it for what they can gain and they're in, they want to keep the child alive or, you know, and others will be expendable. But you notice here, they want to eliminate the victim. Down here, some of this, in one way or another, they want to profit off. So think about a gang, a ganger, if they're taking pictures. These guys are not going to take pictures and put it on the internet. These guys, or dark web. These guys are going to post it on the dark web and make money. So pay-per-view. It's very different here very organized. These guys are not stupid. These guys are stupid to put it on the internet because who's online as well? Or you know, decent, hopefully decent law enforcement. Okay. So these guys run the risk of getting caught. These guys are never going to put what they're doing on the internet. Okay. So they're going to exploit the victim, meaning they're going to benefit in one way or another and there's a degree of organization. So think about organized crime. So the first it's organized, then it's coordinated. We could probably also put these terms, these words, as it goes on, look at methodical. So it's a layering. First, you're taking a group of people and there's structure to it. This is happenstance, happenstance circumstantial, you know, it starts over here. This is planned. So first we have organization, there's structure, somebody's in charge, somebody's, there's a group or an ultimate individual that's calling the shots and therefore they're coordinating things and they're not just coordinating it, but when the rapes are taking place, there's, there's a pattern to it. What happens first? Um, they're going to have a meal first, or they're going to do this first, and then stage two, it's like a play that's unfolding. There's drama to it. Then there's methodical. And this is where SRA meets MKUltra. Sometimes there's overlap. Sometimes there are SRA people that are not part of MKUltra. My hunch is there are some MKUltra people that are not into Satanism. Now, we know, hold on before I lose my audience, we know the spirit behind that, but one does not necessarily mean the other, but there's going to be that overlap. So the MK Ultra people that are into literally, uh, literal satanic ritual abuse. Okay. But then you have just the straight up scientists. And what is their goal? to utilize the victim. So you can have an MK Ultra person that never dons a dark robe, who's just a Nazi scientist, okay? But they're gonna use the victim. So they will kill others, but they don't want to eliminate the victim. They want to utilize the victim, everything from experimentation to in whatever way they're gonna benefit. So with that victim, so with these kind of people, what are they going to do with their victim? They're going to ensure the victim stays alive. But that means, let's say it starts out as a child, that means that child's going to grow up. Well, the older the child gets, now here, right, they're going to silence the child. There's no way, there's no risk, as it were, of the victim uh, telling. Here, there's an increased risk of them telling. So what do you have to do? You don't eliminate the victim by dismembering them and and right? All this is going to be a dismemberment. You're going to silence the victim from the inside out in terms of the different parts. You're going to have the parts, you're going to 
convince parts. You're going to trick them. You're going to program them, but it's tricking them. You're going to convince them so much in different scientific ways, methodological or methodical ways, that the parts then believe that this degree of sadism is not really the degree of sadism that the kid's experiencing. Because every now and then, like, think about up here. These guys never talk nice to their victims. These guys will talk nice at times to their victims, right? You're our special one. You, you're you the alpha dog. You, you, you hunted so well. You did such a good job. You are going to be in a very special place when we set up our kingdom. These guys don't say anything. There's no flattery. There's no positive right? This is carrot in the stick. This is just stick. So a different methodology that's being used, and that takes a greater degree of intelligence, diabolical intelligence. But you can see then the difference between these two perpetrators. These are the ones that are typically arrested. These are rarely arrested. And what happened to Jeffrey Epstein when they're arrested, right? The others will arrange for their elimination. Okay, I'm aware of the time. I will introduce this next one and then we'll pick up where we leave off. What I want to do is I want to bring your attention back to the degree of intensity because when I'm doing my assessments, this is such a key issue, right? It's sort of a ethereal. How do you really measure degree of intensity? Think about like focus. Okay, we've got degree of planning. You can kind of sense, depending upon, was guy lying in wait? Did he have a lot of trophies? You can kind of see that. Was it um, impulsive? Was it with a lot of guys? How much time did they spend online with each other? Here, how much the degree of initiation? But the internal intensity is a little harder to get at. But as goes the degree of intensity, so goes the ability to perpetrate in a sadistic way because you have your you have bloodlust. Where did our bloodlust go? Right, cold blooded. It's up here somewhere, right? Bloodlust. You're obsessed and you're possessed. So as goes the degree of intensity, where that person now is absolutely given over, that will be a huge indicator if you can ferret it out and discern it as to what he probably was into, but not arrested for, especially the smarter they are. So this issue of the degree of intensity is really important. So what we're going to do is this, we're going to expand this one um, level here, or what should I say, this one dynamic, right? Because we're looking at degree of intensity and premeditation. They will always go together, but now I want to expand. We're going to go into their inner world, as it were, and there are degrees within these degrees, and that's what we're going to look at now. So if you notice, I've highlighted this continuum in red. So let's pretend we turn a page and we're just going to look at degree of intensity. So there's our line in red, but now we're going to look at some additional layering. And we will, I'm just going to introduce this and we'll pick this up next time. Okay, so we've looked at intensity, but as you're looking at intensity, there's a couple of other things then that will be part and parcel with intensity. I'm sorry, intensity, which is intentionality. It's very subtle, but to what, ex what extent was not just the degree of it, the energy, but how intentional you can have random energy or really purposeful and how focused the degree of focus. These are all going to come together because a true predator is 100% intense, 100% intentional, and 100% focused. These three will go together, okay? And for someone who's assessing sex offenders or predators, trust me, you need to be able to sense these to, to, to tell uh, the parole board whether or not this guy, let's say he passes sex offender treatment. They did it all the time. Fake it to make it. And now they're sitting in front of me. Should I tell parole? because the guy was graduated out. He was a mentor. I've had a couple of guys like this, right? Should I say, well, he passed sex offender treatment. He's good to go. No, because if I'm sensing a huge issue with this, 
then it makes sense. He was smart enough to fake it to make it, but he is going to go out and he's going to do what? He's going to harm a child. He's going to harm somebody. So I changed it a little bit. Changed what? Look at the word happenstance. I want to go back up because what I decided, opportunity is very circumstantial. Circumstance, we get the word circumstance from happenstance. So it really has to do with by the way, happiness comes from happenstance. So this has to do with things that are not orchestrated and it just by chance. So I wanted to kind of stick with the same theme because on this level, again, think about intensity, degree of intensity. So opportunistic, that meaning circumstances came this person's way. Here it was orchestrated, but here's somebody that's uh, getting into lust, a guy. Okay, so... I'm going to use the term now happenstance. We're going to look at the degree of intensity. So very similar. He's drifting. Think about Niagara River. It's starting to drift now. It's picking up speed. And think about that um, fishing analogy. Drawn away and lured and now hooked. So he's going to go from circumstantial. He's not really, meaning life, these opportunities are finding him. Now he's open to it, and now he's sort of drifting. He's losing his bearings. He hasn't committed a crime quite yet. He certainly now is unethical, and he's immoral. Hasn't crossed the legal line, but partway through, he's now drifting past that line. He's losing his bearings. He's fighting his conscience. He's violating his conscience. And now he's hooked. And now what happens? He's starting to get pulled in, and then here's the compelled. Difference right in there difference in degree. And then he's going to start to become driven. Now I could switch these, but I think this has a better feel. He's driven and then propelled. So this is, he's starting to put down, push down the gas pedal, but this is, he's got a propeller behind him, right? So the, a little, a little bit different um, in terms of energy. And then he's given over. And what happens again, think about the degree of emotional energy and drive propelling him or in the pun there pro propeller so he's given over and now again he's moving forward he doesn't he's never looking back he doesn't want to look back he thinks that's stupid he, this holds nothing for him he's given over insatiable appetite obsessed consumed hellbent and again literally or figuratively possessed, but it has taken him over. We're talking SRA. Yep. Uh, how about MK Ultra? He can be possessed in both ways, right? Evil scientist. He's possessed by this thing. So that's the intensity. Now look, let's look at how intentional the degrees of strategic planning and focused attention deliberately engaged in by the perpetrator to achieve his goal. Okay, so strategic planning and focus. Now, here's straight up focus, but focused attention, a little bit different. But again, how much is he thinking in terms of and becoming a chess master? He's starting to play chess in here. He's sitting at the board here, and now he's starting to get into it. And before you know it, he's the chess master and very much strategic. And that's why the um, psychopath is into game theory. Okay, so first, the guy's unguarded. He's open to circumstances. And by the way, look at the focus. He's unfocused. As a matter of fact, let me springboard between these two. And then you look at the degree of focus. Uh, degree of focused attention in obtaining the desired outcome. Here is kind of the process. And here's he's, what he wants as far as the outcome. It's sort of a goal and outcome. A little bit different, but a fine difference. It's important to apprehend both meaning to really get a sense what's going on inside the guy. Circumstances are happening. Therefore, it's kind of happenstance. This guy is unguarded. He's an idiot. He's an accident that's starting to uh, happen. He has no guardrails and he's unfocused, which will lead to what? Opportunistic, right? He's drifting. Opportunity is going to find him. And then he's going to be open to opportunities. And then he starts to become more focused on what? what he's being pulled by. So here he's unfocused in his life, but now he becomes focused, but on the wrong thing. Because now he's also crossing legal lines. So he's perpetrating now. 
He's open to, so here it was opportunistic, and now he's open to evil. And now he invites evil. Now it's very, and we can say literally and figuratively, but if a guy gets into this kind of porn, oh, he's inviting stuff, but he's wanting it more and more, right? Mick Jagger, I can't get no satisfaction somewhere that's probably in here. So he's not only inviting evil, but now it's very purposeful, willful, deliberate, methodical, calculated, and strategic degrees of intentionality, and then the focused. So it goes from being unfocused, all of a sudden, this becomes his focus, and now he's targeted. So now he's zeroing in on, because he's all in. Now he's purpose-driven. Now he's captivated. He's undeterred. He's, he's unstoppable now. Now he's mission focused and laser focused. If you get someone who is possessed and strategic and laser focused, can they do things such as take a child and they're already inflicting trauma on the child and they're overwhelming and immobilizing them and horrifying them and incapacitating them. And now they're gonna terrorize and they're going to split the mind, ensure compliance, secure silence and include dark things. If they are laser focused, they're possessed strategic uh, in their methodology will go up if they're diabolical, right? Can they do evil things like we heard in that um, news piece, the beginning, where they use blood, they use stuff, they use kids and even Levitt himself said, he knows some victims that were the victim of ritualistic abuse. So yes, it happens. And that's how men, you know, females as well, but we're focusing on men because that's the, the clientele. That's the population that I work with. These men, the further they go from left to right, they're either going to become more reactive and impulsive or more controlled and methodical. And that's SRA and that's MK Ultra. So the people that did this to you, if you are a victim of SRA or MK Ultra, they were going to do to you what they did, regardless. They were playing a mind game with you because you thought what? You thought there was the ability somehow, there had to be a reason why they were doing it, but really they did it to you. Why? Because they wanted to. Okay, rough note to end on, but I think, Emma, that probably gives everybody enough to, <laughs> that's an earful right there. But we're going to continue to unpack this even more, some of the intensity, and then we're going to look at some additional factors next time. And there we go. So. Awesome, John. That was fantastic. Thank you so much again for you know all the work that you put into these presentations to bringing so many years of your own, you know, purpose and your career and, and learnings into such condensed forms for us to learn. This is so valuable. Like I wish that we all learned this, you know, in school to some degree, or that this was part of, of our curriculum growing up. You know, it's so easy to carry those knapsacks, like you say, and it's really empowering to have just a different lens to look through um, about this stuff that's that gives us hope, like you always say, um, and that that's rooted in science. Like this is stuff that, you know, people can't argue about. Like they can go look at all your years of work. Like that's unparalleled, you know, what you've been able to discover through all these years. So thank you so much for putting that together for us. I appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you hanging in there and doing this series and we'll give people hope. We're not all, you know, maybe a couple more weeks of this just to really give people a sense of what kind of person can do heinous things to a kid in a methodical fashion because SRA and MK Ultra is methodical, intelligent, evil individuals. Look at Levitt, my own hunch. I kind of already know what he's into. Look at... So here you have a, dist a county district attorney, more than likely based upon his own testimony, what he, the words he was saying, the fact that he was able to not only confirm there's SRA, a ritualistic abuse, but then say, oh yeah, it's no big deal. It's like turn, telling a kid to, teaching a dog to roll over, or it's like making a bed. You look at his facial expression, who would ever find that funny? And who would ever, how does he, you know, 
oh, that's how you program a kid. It's like, okay, I've been doing this for 30 years, buddy. I'm not quite that casual and dang, that came flowing right out of you, but you've been an attorney. How do you like know that? And you use the term what? Nobody gave him that term program. Oh, here's how you program a kid, give oral sex. Programmed. There, there was way too much about his self, his own words. Tell me, okay, this is a really unusual guy. But he's the district attorney. And he's really involved in a structured church. And two people have already been arrested. A therapist who's involved in that same church and the guy's wife. So we have an organized group highly intelligent in positions of in positions of trust authority respect especially authority that span multiple jurisdictions multiple counties and the question is how does it happen and for the survivors they need to know there was nothing that they could have done or didn't do that they didn't do enough of or they did too much of these predators are that smart, they were that deceptive, and they lied to all of their survivors to trick them. So we're helping disclose the truth so the truth can set them free, the, the survivors. And then we'll get back to once somebody can be persuaded that you don't have to be trauma bonded anymore, you don't owe these perps anything. These are just evil individuals. So no more loyalty and no more keeping secrets and no more harming yourself. All those protective parts, as far as the parts that are um, self-injurious, that if the little ones disclose, now there's the threat of suicide. There's those different kill switch kind of things on the inside. Those are the parts that still believe that the sadistic perpetrators on some level were legitimate or nice. And they weren't. These are bad men. So no more having to turn it in on oneself. So that's why we're doing this. And then we'll get back to looking at the chart and being productive in therapy. <laughs> All this has to do with, you know, with therapy in a way um, and trying to understand trauma, trying to understand what causes it. And of course the people that cause it, I think that that's such an important element to add to it. So these graphs are awesome. I know that this series is really helping people. And I know I speak for everybody. We're really excited to keep diving into all of this with you on the perpetrator side and on the survivor side, learning about how, what these perpetrators do actually affect, you know, children. So Super excited for next week and uh, really appreciate you, again, giving us condensed versions of your many, many decades of research and all the hours that you've worked with people. Um, it's really awesome to see it all come together and how much these two elements complement each other. So kudos to you, John. You're definitely leading the pack in your field. And I'm getting more and more therapists that are commenting on your post too, which is really cool. Um, so it's starting to be seen and it gives me hope that there are therapists out there that, you know, just don't know, I guess, how to navigate this world like like you did, don't know where to start, you know, and hopefully you can accelerate their learning. Because um, I know back when you were first discovering this, there wasn't much to go off of, you know, you had to sort of piece it up all together by yourself. So this is also hopefully accelerating the learning of people who help survivors and giving them tools to begin their own research and journey just like you did. So this is awesome. And I mean, this was uh, just a piece of what you normally would do. You have your your hands in a lot of different elements of this movement, uh, which is really awesome. So I'd love for you to, to share with people where they can connect with you about all your websites and where they can keep up with you and learn more. Well, you're too kind and we'll just do it quickly because we've looked at these previously and you're a trooper, Emma. And if anybody's still watching, they're a trooper as well for hanging in there. So <laughs> I've got a couple of resources that people can access. The first is my primary site, survivorsupport.net. Um, or there's, a, we could, okay, either one, right? So survivorsupport.net, this is 
uh, for survivors that want uh, adjunctive help or ongoing help in between their own sessions, or if they're not quite sure whether or not they were abused, they're, they're trying to figure out, um, they may see the indicators, or for those that want to better help support survivors in terms of on their journey to healing. So the best way to use this is from left to right. I do have a Friday night program. You can access that right on that website right there. It's called Journey to Healing. Uh, the good news is we just deal with counseling topics. So that's nice. Uh, we deal with boundaries and we are in the midst of an extended series on forgiveness, what it is versus what it is not. It's about 30 hours thus far. There will be a total of about 50 hours. We have to be very correct and methodical because it'll either... Um, bind someone, so to speak. It'll keep someone captive or set someone free, depending upon if we get forgiveness right or not. Um, the podcasts, you can access past programs of Journey to Healing under the podcast tab. So there's a growing repository of that. Uh, what else? I have a blog. So survivorsupport.net. And you can access it either just straight in a browser, survivorsupport.us, or there, uh, I have a couple of them uh, dealing with the trans deception, trans movement, and then a lot dealing with predators. Um, you can tell I haven't been able to really do much recently, but these are really important, I think, uh, blogs or blog posts that will provide good information about the nature of predators as well as the dangers of the trans movement. So that's survivorsupport.net. Uh, under the insights tab, by the way, a lot of information. So just spend time on there working your way down. I'm doing abbreviated uh, compilation of these under the fourth tab down indicators of trauma. But if you want to get the full question and answer part, <laughs> you have to come to the imagination uh, podcast. So Emma, you have all the question and answers. So, but a lot of information on that. The, the next the site I have is a little more research oriented. It's my training site for churches. Uh, why? Because the most sophisticated predators love going to church. Think about what we just talked about, the predators in the Mormon church, the Catholic church, they're all over the place. So um, the insights tab, you can see insights and then the insights 2024, it got too big. So I had, uh, I, I need to do April. So I need to catch up. Um, so I, deposit or I do screenshots of social media posting really from my Twitter page. I just don't have time to do any other social media, but if you want to find out kind of what I post or sometimes depending upon the situation, I will get into educational debates with perpetrators who come on my page. So perp or perps or perp apologists. And so I will capture those so that people can see, you don't want to do this at home, so to speak, but if you want to see, perpetrators unmasked and how quickly they will resort to very predictable and time-tested methods of gaslighting manipulation, how they do their dance. I have a number of those threads. So you can go on and read how quick they are, how fast they are, how manipulative they are. Um, under the truths tab, that is um, some of the clinical work. So that would be a good one to spend time on there. Um, there's feedback from my time working in the Pennsylvania Department uh, Department of Corrections and under the regular insights tab or just that insights tab, if you wanna find out uh, the story behind my whistleblowing, I was the first psychology staff in the US to blow the whistle on inmate abuse uh, in long-term solitary confinement. And what else? Oh, um, unmasking the trans movement. So if anybody wants uh, good definitive clinical information, this is the site to go. We have, I forget how many, 75 episodes, each are 30 minutes long. Uh, we're going to be doing another one here in the day, in a day or two. Uh, the trans movement is the, a predator's dream can come true, a financial predator and a sexual predator. So we need to be able to protect women and kids with that. And then I guess my uh, YouTube. So we have Unmasking the Trans Movement YouTube. Uh, and uh, that's maybe an easier way to find the podcast, most up to date. 
And if anybody wants to, so we're getting the subscribers up. So I appreciate Emma's followers. Awesome. If you want to do me a favor, go on there and subscribe. And you will then, of course, be notified when we put the additional episodes up there. And then also my YouTube, which is, I forget my name. It's my name, John underscore Euler. John K. Euler LPC. Oh, Sorry, I can't keep up with all these. <laughs> you know? I know. <laughs> right. And so there, there's my, so everything I do in successive order is up there. Uh, I do have some playlists. So if you, I, I try to remember to separate these things out, but if you actually want a chronology of everything I've published in order, you have it right there. So you can see I fluctuate depending on about uh, 15 of the journey to healing programs behind. So there's a lot in the can, so to speak, waiting to be brought up to speed. And I think, is that, I think that's it. Emma. Hello. Oh, you're Twitter. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. You're right. <laughs> you, can tell, you can tell I'm not self-promoting. That's for sure. Okay. And then my Twitter page, which has the links to all, all the stuff, but there's my Twitter page. Oh, that's the underscore. Okay, now I know which one has the underscore. I can't yeah. keep up with all these, even though I'm doing it. That's funny. <laughs> I know. So, I feel the same way on social yeah, media. You've got a lot yourself. I don't know how you keep up with it. So, Well, my yours are all named something different. Mine is just yeah. either my name yeah. or my podcast. So I don't have as much to, you know, as much to remember. You have a lot of different, uh, like I said, you have your hands in a lot of different sides of this movement. Um, so it's definitely a lot more to remember. But I would say for anybody, obviously go follow him on both of his YouTube channels, get those subscribers up, go dig into all the free content. Same thing on Survivor Support and Church Protect, and obviously Unmasking the Trans Movement, all of those websites, hours and hours and hours of free content. And definitely go follow John's Twitter to get his daily updates, any daily news articles, um, what's happening in the world of perpetrators online. Um, you get to see John in action, uh, fighting off the evil that tries to attack him. Um, you guys will basically get to see what goes in the insights tab if you guys follow him on Twitter. So go keep up with him. He puts any interviews that he's doing, anything that he's up to, any new videos published, any new articles, um, anything new, you guys can find it on here as well as all the day-to-day -day stuff. If you guys aren't uh, very privy in the news or maybe like keeping up with articles like I am. I always love skimming John's page and seeing what what's happening in the trans movement. It, it's, you know, I feel like every day it kind of elevates to new stories and new heights and John helps chronicle that. Um, lots of stuff also for survivors um, and just research and, and, and daily articles. So please go follow him on all these platforms. Go support him. John puts out, like I said, hours and hours and hours and hours of free content. Um, there is no excuse to not go support and watch. We can all use this material. Um, it's very expensive a lot of times to hire a therapist. And if you're thinking about it, this survivor support especially is a great way to get your feet wet um, to go. Obviously, the series that you're listening to is fantastic. If you guys want extra survivor support go check out all those videos that he has it's it's basically like getting free therapy in my opinion you guys learn a lot and you guys can get your feet wet with this stuff and you know get confident that way you you can get that help that you want and that you need eventually whenever you feel more comfortable and confident in seeking out a therapist and vetting them um and obviously uh knowing what tools you need to bring to the table too and be and to be prepared with so john thank you again so much for all this free content that you make. Thank you for keeping up with everything. Uh, all the articles that you post, all the news that you post, all the videos, everything. I don't know where you find the time to do it on top of all the counseling and, and the groups that you do every day, but we, we're really grateful and appreciate it. More than welcome. And Emma, I commend you uh, for your work. You're busy as I'll get out too. So here's, uh, we're doing what we can to try to help. We're doing what we can. Satan's not taking a day off, so we don't either, you know? Right. <laughs> it's like, that's not really a healthy way to look at it. It is good to yeah, take time off, managers. you guys. Yeah, uh, we okay. just, you know, like to try to bring awareness to this as much as possible. So please, you guys go support John. I'll have all of his links in the show notes for you. They all light up as hyperlinks, no matter what platform you're on. Go watch all his videos. Go support him. Go lift him up. Go share his content with a friend. It's a really good way to sort of ease people into this too, I found. I've been sending John's playlist to other survivors, to people curious about learning. 
Um, and obviously to allies and help that is wanting to learn about systems and, you know, just the gentler parts of, uh, of healing versus uh, maybe all the details that are exposed in some of my other episodes. So go share, go dig in, you guys go support. We're so grateful for you guys. We can't wait to see you guys again next week. Thanks for tuning in to our weekly series. All my links will be in the show notes. Also, we're grateful for you guys. We couldn't do this without you. God bless you all. And we'll see you next week.